All right. So today, what we are going to do is we are going to. So yesterday, the main theme. There are two. One, how changes in development enables evolution. Evolution. And second, we looked at cell lineage and fate mapping. Right. The various techniques involved in it. So then I ended up saying that in the next class, let us look at how development is controlled. So that is what we are going to uh, learn today. So much of what we are going to go through today is uh, again refreshing the history, uh, but my firm belief is that that helps in shaping our own thinking of development. Okay. So you might think, oh, these are all history; it's over, and what's the point of knowing? We know now the truth. That that, that is an argument, a valid argument, but I st still feel it is worth taking a few minutes to look at the history. You know how the thought shaped up in a given field. So, so therefore, here, like epigenesis and preformation, we are going to get into another controversy. That was laid to rest, believe it or not, only a few years ago. Okay, um, in about 20 years ago only the ultimate proof came for that. So, we will look at that. So, most of you already know um, all cells have same set of chromosomes and that is from where this concept called genomic equivalence comes. What it means is you take any cell of the adult body they, pro they have the same set of chromosomes. There are exceptions. Uh, our RBCs do not even have a nucleus and if you <coughs> were willing to think little bit more, some of you may have already done an immunology course, right. So, have you learned VDJ recombination, <coughs> but at least you will know this, uh, you know <coughs> in response to a foreign material our B cells are capable of generating an antibody that is customized for a particular pathogen, right? Particular shape actually, it is not even pathogen. So, that how is that being made possible, right? So, their genome again undergoes uh, rearrangement, that is what is VDJ recombination. So, each B cell therefore has a genome that is different from another B cell, leave alone another somatic cell. So, there are variations, but by and large. <coughs> most of the somatic cells in any organism has the same set of chromosomes and that is what we call as genomic equivalence. So, now the question is <coughs> what controls development? Is it the cytoplasm of the oocyte? You know oocyte comes with a huge cytoplasm, it is much bigger than most of the other cells. So, does it come with all the required thing for an organism's development? So, that was one school of thought. Another one was chromosomes, it is the chromosomes that determine not the cytoplasm. So, then <coughs> people pursued both of this to find evidences, you know that is how science progresses. So, we will see those. So, one of the really famous embryologists, you know he, he has contributed uh, really substantially to the field of uh, development as well as genetics and uh, his name is Theodore Boveri. So, <coughs> one of his evidences is what we are going to look at that is, um, so he looked at cytoplasm, okay, we are going to skip some of the genetics here that is how did people find Mendel's genes are located on chromosomes okay, that we are ignoring. So, in genetics class we can learn that. So, here we are assuming that we already know that genes are on chromosomes. Uh, very briefly one of the things was the behavior of chromosomes when cyto cytologists looked and observed the chromosomes were following Mendel's laws. Okay. So, that is very briefly one sentence description of that evidence and there are more, uh, some of them we will see here too. <coughs> so, what he did is he took this sea urchin, have you seen them? So, even a 10 minute walk down the Elliot's beach, you will pick them on the uh, sand. So, I have done it multiple times. I have done in Elliot's beach as well as I have done in Thiruvallur beach and I have done multiple times in Mahavalipuram. Okay. So, next time when you go to beach, uh, just walk along combing the 
C shore you will find these. So, they are there, but many of the uh, mollusk, crustaceans, uh, you know, you can find them on the beach, live organism. So, you can observe them. So, that is interesting. And you can see huge turtles <coughs> and nesting, that also you can see. So, so he took sea urchin and this is external fertilization. So, a lot of people used sea urchin for studying fertilization. So, that is another topic, okay, very uh, in the later part of this course we will learn that. So, he <coughs> fertilized with a large excess of sperm such that he got some of the zygotes with more than one sperm like as you see here, okay, two sperm. And then he allowed to embryogenesis to progress and it sets up you know four poles like two spindles and therefore, it ends up making all kinds of weird spindles and you end up dividing into four cells at a point it should have divided into <laughs> two cells and each one having varying numbers of chromosomes and uh, he isolated blastomias and showed when chromosomal abnormalities were there they just did not progress further in cell division and died. So, here you are seeing that an embryo disintegrating cells and death of embryo. So, this is one of the evidences indicating that normal embryogenesis requires normal number of chromosomes. So, therefore, chromosomes matter. Okay. Um, and two other scientists, Nettie Stevens, you know she was a postdoc of T. H. Morgan, he is a very famous geneticist. But originally, he supported cytoplasmic control of development. Yes, so so the embryologists were of two schools at that time. So one of T. H. Morgan's postdoc, Nettie Stevens, she strongly felt it's the chromosomes, and she went and worked with this guy Edmund Wilson, who also believed in it, and they showed in many organisms. Sex determination is by the chromosomes, X Y or X 0 in many organisms are male and X X was female. So, that was another support and ironically see you see the way science progresses. T H Morgan tested this more rigorously and nailed down you know the drosophila eye color gene is inherited you know on an X chromosome basis, it is a sex linked inheritance and that eventually proved chromo genes are on chromosomes. So, that is how science progresses, people do not get stuck on an idea forever, when evidence is surface they change their opinion. Okay. So, this is some interesting history to know, so I am assuming some of you are going to be you know some of you are budding scientists and therefore, the way thought process shapes up, uh, shaped up in the past scientists will be useful. So, so that is one part. So, these are all evidences that are being stacked to show chromosomes matter and you are obviously now having a question. The question is if all cells have the same chromosomes and chromosomes direct development, then how different kinds of cells come? how come the same set of chromosomes um, you know make my heart and make my lungs as well right how is that being possible so that's a big question so august wiesman proposed a theory called germplasm theory okay so this is one of the really serious milestones in biology so many biologists consider this germplasm theory its importance as next only to Darwin's theory of evolution. So, what is this theory? He is the first one to distinguish somatic cells from germ cells. So, he proposed that the germ cells maintain all the chromosomes, the genetic material in its entirety and that is passed on from generation to generation, continuity of germ line. Okay. So, whereas, the somatic cells that come out of these germ cells in every generation that is germ cells fuse like the gametes fuse generate the zygote and from the zygote you get germ cells as well as the rest of the body and the rest of the body for example, muscles receive only the instructions needed to make muscle 
and blood cells receive only the instructions to make blood cells. Neurons receive the information to make neurons. So, this is what is germplasm theory is and this is how he thought different cells become different kinds of cells. So, well, Bovary is further experiment. So, this was a major milestone okay. Uh, because this uh, the reason this is major milestone is this helps us to distinguish Lamarck's view of evolution from Darwin's view of evolution. Okay. So, use disuse theory would demand the information in the muscle goes to the next generation. So, that is the only way learned characters can be acquired and germplasm theory explains why that would not happen because information from muscle does not go to the next generation. So, only the germ cell goes. So, therefore, random selection from changes that happen in the germ cell chromosomes is what gets selected in every generation. Okay. So, that is how this germplasm theory helped in understanding Darwin's theory of evolution. Okay. The, the main component of Darwin's theory of evolution is not that he first told evolution happens. He, the main contribution is finding a mechanism for evolution. So, the mechanism is natural selection and for that this was very useful to explain why uh, acquired characters are not going to be passed on directly to the, the right next generation. So, Boveri did uh, additional experiments that sort of supported germplasm theory that is primarily because of the organism he chose. So, C. elegans was the not the first nematode that was picked up for studies. Um, so, in 1901 Boveri was using Ascaris, but you need to remember Ascaris is a parasitic nematode. So, finally Boveri died of infection by Ascaris years later okay. he had a long life, but died of the model or killed by the model organism. So, the reason he chose this is it has only two chromosomes. So, again you see this for addressing specific biological questions you need to have knowledge of organisms ok. So, then only you will know which organism is suitable to address a specific question without which you would just not be able to answer. So, that is why it is more important to learn botany and zoology before actually you learn uh, molecular biology and biochemistry ok. So, so, that is why we will not find C. elegans, we will not find Drosophila, we will not find Arabidopsis because we do not learn organisms. So, he knew this has only two chromosomes and therefore, it will be easy to observe what happens to these two chromosomes as cells divide. So, August V means theory proposes that the somatic cells will have different contents ok. Uh, is this happening to these two chromosomes and it did happen ok. So, as only two chromosomes easy to follow and here are the cell divisions. Some of you who are learning C. elegans would see that the names he uses is what we use in C. elegans also like EMS, endoderm muscles come from that, P1, P2, P3, P4 the germ line lineage. So, that is how he named them. So, here if you look at it in the first one this uh, bottom one is going to be the future germ line ok. So, you have the chromosomes here and go to the next one when this uh, top cell is setting up the next spindle for the next division you see the chromosomes are sort of breaking in. So, this is what is happening while here it remains intact and you go through this over division. So, this is the one that is going to be germ cell, this is the one that is going to be germ cell, this is the one that is going to be germ cell and you look at the adjacent cells the chromosomes break. So, it is an it is the uh, compared to this is this is the most recent one that came out of this lineage here it is not fragmented so much, but in earlier somatic blastomias yes, you see it fragmented very strongly. So, this process is called chromosome diminution ok and you go further in a embryo where the cleavage is over the two primordial germ cells retain the chromosomes intact while in others it has broken into smaller pieces. So, this is a strong support for germplasm theory that is ok. So, that is Ascaris, but is this happening in every organism right, uh, but this is not what happens in other organisms. 
So, that means there must be other explanations in other organisms to support germplasm theory or germplasm theory may be wrong. So, so we need, so therefore, the objection for nuclear control of development persisted. So, people still thought that nucleus may not be everything, meaning chromosomes may not be everything, cytoplasm probably still is the key. So, the only way to address this is to really take nucleus of a fully differentiated somatic cell and show that it can direct an egg into a fully developed embryo. So, that is what was required. Really what you needed is somatic nuclear transfer. So, that required some technical advancement like you needed to find a way to take the nucleus out of an egg and at the same time activate the egg, egg gets uh, egg, so cytoplasm gets activated when sperm enters. So, you needed to do that. Then you introduce a somatic nucleus and that had to be figured out and people did that eventually like uh, Keith Porter developed a technique for doing this. So, he found that by poking in and trying to just move the nucleus out, not only removed the nucleus that ended up activating the cytoplasm of the egg as well. So, this is called Porter's technique. Okay, so, he found a way to remove the nucleus from the egg and you know making further improvements on that Briggs and King they were able to show that transplanted nucleus from other cells can actually uh, make a frog egg develop normally. Okay. But the only difference is that uh, they were able to go up to a certain stage like up to blastula stage, but not up to the tadpole stage. And that weight needed is some more you know optimization and they had to work on a different set of frog. And um, so, here is an um, you know example of how this is done. So, this is actually a movie, but I am sure the movie is not going to play. So, essentially so, you have a skin cell, you have an egg cell, then you take the nucleus out and then you introduce the nucleus from the skin cell and then allow it to develop. So, the way you do that is, so this is an egg. So, here you have a capillary where you apply gentle pressure, therefore, it is held in position, it does not move away. Okay. So, this technique will vary from organism to organism, this holds true for most of the mammals and even in vertebrates. Um, so, you the, here is suction applied, so it is held in place. So, then this is the needle that you are going to poke in and in that you are going to gently uh, take the nucleus out and the other nucleus that you get from skin cell essentially what you are doing is you are putting that entire cell into this um, and then its nucleus is going to be, uh, it is a deployed nucleus. So, you, you do not have sperm in this and you watch what happens. So, there, there were two issues with Briggs and King experiment, one is that it did not go beyond blast loss stage and the other one is they used from another embryonic cell, okay, it is still an undifferentiated cell, it is not equivalent of a fully developed somatic organ. So, John Gordon who got Nobel Prize uh, just few years ago, less than 10 years ago I forgot, um, but very recently. Okay. Uh, got Nobel Prize for that, but the work was done in 1962. So, he got Nobel Prize along with the Yamanaka group of for doing somatic cloning in mouse. Okay. So, but they did it very recently in mouse, but he had done in 1960s and he showed that you can take intestinal cell nuclei and introduce by using Briggs and King's technique and they can actually develop all the way up to tadpoles. And using different genetic makeup like for example, here you have a dark colored frog um, and uh, you take the nuclei uh, from this light colored one and using its egg then you show that all the progeny are like the nucleus donor, okay. showing that two things, one nucleus directs development and second evidence for genomic equivalence, right. He is taking intestinal cells and they are having it 
Of course, people have done with other somatic cells as well now, you know variety of somatic cells have been used. And this is one more evidence. So, this uh, I am sure some of you were born by the time this was published, um, th it is that recent. So, you know um, Wilmot in Scotland, so he and his group they were able to do very similar experiment in sheep. Um, like this is a uh, you know oocyte donor from which you are taking the egg, then you take it out the nucleus and the spindle and then you take the other cells from um, you know the nucleus donor and then you transfer into the enucleated oocyte and then allow it to develop sorry, sorry yeah. So, allow it to uh, like you activate it by electric shock, the, so that allows the membrane membrane fusion. Then you culture them in embryo up to this stage blastocyst and then you um, you know implant in the surrogate mother and then the progeny is genetically identical to the nucleus donor not the one that provided the oocyte ok. So, this clearly nails down that uh, there is genomic equivalence as well as nucleus drives the development. So, so this is the dolly and uh, its own baby here ok. But this is not this this is not to say that DNA alone is responsible for development ok. So, there are variations to this largely true concept. So, those variations are you know subtle variations, but still important one of them is illustrated here ok. So, this kitten is somatic clone from this cat and in these cats the coat color has random variations and that is because of random inactivation of one of the X chromosomes. Uh, but to ok to get to that there is a concept called dosage compensation right. So, all the girls here have two X chromosomes and boys have only one X chromosome. So, are we going to have double the amount of X chromosome output or are we going to have half of the output in boys right, but at the end it is the same output that is because the one extra X chromosome is inactivated. So, there are multiple mechanisms to handle uh, dosage compensation, but we will not get into all of them. So, we will just consider the organisms where one X chromosome is inactivated. So, which X chromosome is inactivated and at what stage in development? So, that varies from organism to organism and in this cat it is random inactivation in every one of the somatic cells. So, depending on in which part of the skin which X chromosome is inactivated you get different color patterns and due to that this kitten does not look identical ok. So, so that is one and so these are epigenetic modification ok the DNA still remains the same and DNA is largely responsible and there are other uh, situations like environment can still have influence. So, DNA is not the sole determinant, but for the original question the answer is yes it is the um, set of chromosomes that determine development. So, this is actually how we learned chromosomes direct development and the genetic content is of most cells are equivalent I am saying most because there are variations like our RBCs immune cells. So, if that is the case then same set of chromosomes how they direct development you know each cell has to become different kind of cell how does that happen. So, therefore, the postulate here is development must proceed by temporarily inactivating parts of chromosomes because the chromosomes still exist there is no chromosome diminution as we saw in Ascaris. So, that means part of the chromosome is expressed in one type of cell and another part is expressed in another kind of cell and so on. And that is what brings us to a concept called differential gene expression. So, most of the modern developmental biologists 
deal with this idea of differential gene expression. So, that is what people focus on, much of the research is about that. So, genes control development and if the about to what is the answer, it is the differential gene expression. Okay. So, so that is the end of this discussion. So, we will move on to our next thing. So, we will look at how the differential gene expression actually happens since we have few more minutes. Um, so, gene expression actually can be controlled at different levels. I am sure many of you may be already familiar from your molecular biology class, but just to give continuity I will quickly go through them. So, you can have differences in gene transcription. For example, globin gene is not transcribed in pancreatic cells which produce insulin and other cells do not produce them. Okay. So, that is a transcription level. So, a gene may be transcribed in one type of cell, but not in another type. So, that is differential tra gene transcription. And second, similar difference may exist at the level of nuclear RNA processing, for example, splicing uh, and export out of the nucleus. So, that might vary. In a, in a given tissue, a particular gene's mRNA may not be exported out while the same mRNA is exported into the cytoplasm uh, in another type of cell. So, that is selective nuclear RNA processing and then you have selective messenger RNA translation. For example, if you take two uh, tissues like the um, you know germ cells or neurons there the response required is really quick like if you take neurons for example, the response required is really quick. So, you cannot be activating in uh, the expression of a new gene all the way starting from transcription onwards, you may not have the time. So, in such situations you have mRNA is already made, but not translated till it is needed. Okay. Similarly, if you take uh, uh, reproductive uh, you know the, the, the bi biological process of reproduction, uh, early embryonic development will not have the during the rapid cleavage will not have the ability to do everything by starting from transcription onwards. Lot of uh, proteins required during early embryogenesis, their mRNAs are already transcribed in the mother's germline and brought in via the oocyte cytoplasm where the mRNA are kept translationally quiescent and that translation is sequentially activated as and when they are required. Okay. So, these are two uh, very good examples where translation control plays a major role. So, that is how you have selective messenger RNA translation. So, that is another step of gene expression where you can have control to bring about differential <laughs> gene expression. And Another important step. So, these are the four really key steps, but there are other uh, you know sub steps in each one of these where you can have gene expression control. So, do not think gene expression control means transcriptional control, that is a common misconception among many students who have not studied developmental biology. Okay. But after this course, you are not going to have that feeling. And you can have at the level of protein modification, right. So, you have seen two kinds of protein modification if you have attended the biochemistry class, one is zymogen inact activation like protein is made pre pro protein and then it is cleaved to generate the final product like some of the hormones and blood clotting factors and so on. And then you have other proteins where post translational modifications such as phosphorylation activate or inactivate proteins. So, these are the levels at which you can actually make differences among the cell types in terms of <coughs> what genes are expressed and what genes are not expressed. So, we are going to look at uh, the these regulations and before we go into this, we are going to have a good idea of chromosome structure and a good idea of eukaryotic gene structure okay that's what we are going to do in the next few slides so i'm sure you are familiar but i just want to quickly go through this um, so this is crystal structure of the same here okay so it's the chromosome with all the proteins proteins are histones here right 
So, you have the different uh, histones, the, the four different ones differently colored here and the DNA is wrapped around it and pay attention to these tails. So, these are histone tails okay, coming out. So, they are important for our discussion and you have one histone. So, this orange rod like structure so that H1 that plays a key role in really compacting this structure into a long spring like structure. Okay. I am per, uh, particularly and intentionally avoiding the word is solenoid because some of you will have to go and look at the dictionary to find what solenoid mean. It means a spring, okay, a coil. So, so this coiling is possible because of the H1 that binds here that can actually pull them together and make them become a coil like this. So, this is how our chromosome exists, you know tightly coiled condensed structure. So, it is a uh, you know a super coiling because here itself you have coiling and then you have additional layer of coiling and each individual one is nucleosome. So, they contain uh, 8 uh, molecules of histones you know H 2 A, H 2 B 4 of them then H 3 2, H 4 2. So, that is the structure here okay. and pay attention to these tails. So, this is how a chromosome exists. Now, let us pay attention to these tails as yeah. So, it so happens some parts of the chromosome is tightly condensed and we call them heterochromatin and there uh, most of these tails on H 3 and H 4 are methylated and the methylation normally promotes this coiling and these are usually transcriptionally silent. The transcription factors and RNA polymerase do not have ready access to this okay, unless otherwise a special kind of transcription factor called pioneer transcription factors that we will learn later when they come and open it up. And in uncondensed nucleosomes where you have the, this one single structure is a nucleosome. Okay. Um, in uncondensed nucleosomes the histones lack the methylation marks not all of the methylation marks, uh, but majority of these and they are usually acetylated. Okay. So, acetylation in H 2, H 3, H 4 so that marks active chromatin. So, here you are seeing a control of gene expression at the anatomy of the chromosome okay. and it is largely regulated by modifications to these tails and that is why I was telling pay attention to the tail at the crystal structure level itself. So, this gives you an idea of how they are available readily or rather readily accessible for enzymes that could add or remove methyl group or acetyl group. So, now a closer look at one of the nucleosomes particularly focusing on H 3 tail. So, here if you look at you have so these red ones are the methylation marks. So, some of the red methylation marks combined with the acetylation in general activate transcription. So, that is that, the point I want to make here it is not that methylation means inactivation regardless of where the methylation is. So, here these numbers 79, 38, 27, 9, 4 etcetera um, refer to lysine residues in H 3 starting from its N terminus to C terminus. So, depending on which one of these lysines are methylated and whether the overall chromatin is acetylated or not determines whether it is going to be active or not. So, these are shown here for example, when you have H 3 K 4 okay, H 3 slicine 4 is methylated then this factor is going to bind and that leads to transcriptional activation okay. um, and here H 3 K 9 methylation silent heterochromatin. Okay. So, so, this is how modifications to histones can uh, have an impact on gene expression. So, here is the control is at the transcriptional level ok. So, the chromosome anatomy itself affecting transcription. So, we have another layer that affects transcription. For example, 
um, and also to avoid confusion you need to remember in addition to methylation which is a post translational modification of the histone which is a protein you have methylation of nitrogenous bases on DNA as well for example, cytosine methylation. So, do not get confused between the two methylations. So, in a chromosome DNA can be methylated which is not our current discussion and you can have proteins that are methylated as well. So, here we are talking about protein methylation and the protein is histone clear ok. So, having looked at the chromosome as a whole now we will refresh our memory about the structure of a eukaryotic uh, gene. So, so, I do not understand what is the problem, but most students after going through molecular biology course even after couple of years later when you ask them to draw the structure of a eukaryotic chromosome they have gene they have problems and people do not understand for example, where is a promoter with respect to start codon and what is phi prime untranslated region ok. Is 3 prime untranslated region present in the chromosome or not and is the poly A tail present in the chromosome or where does it come from. So, like that people have confusions to avoid that we are going to refresh our memory of the structure of a eukaryotic gene. So, so, this horizontal bar represents the DNA sequence ok of a part of eukaryotic chromosome. So, here first we will focus on what is easy for us to understand that is the coding sequence. So, the coding sequence is, is divided into exons meaning there are intervening sequences that are not going to be part of the mature mRNA. So, they are intron 1, intron 2 here. So, you need to get rid of this in the final mature mRNA and have the sequences corresponding to this exon 1 in the DNA, exon 2 right after that and exon 3 right after that. So, then only starting from the start codon which is ATG coding for methionine you go all the way to stop codon. So, when you look at the gene structure these coding sequences are divided into exons with intervening introns is this clear. So, this we understood now starting from ATG to stop codon ok stop codon somewhere uh, here ok. So, this 146 let us say. So, then when you look at the 3 prime end you have um, you know further sequences and they are called the 3 prime untranslated region meaning these are present in the mRNA mature mRNA, but they do not code for amino acids these are sequences beyond stop codon. So, the primary point I want to emphasize is the mRNA has sequences beyond the stop codon and that is called <coughs> 5 prime 3 prime untranslated region because in terms of the directionality of the mRNA it is 5 prime to 3 prime. So, it is 3 prime untranslated region. So, obviously, that is coming from the chromosome it is transcribed from the chromosome and it is retained in the mRNA therefore, it is an exon 3 prime UDR corresponds to an exon just like the amino acid co coding um, sequences. And in that RNA sequence that 3 prime UTR you have sequences like poly A poly adenylation uh, size signaling sequence which signals two things one cleavage of the RNA from the primary transcript and then promoting polyadenylation like poly A tails are added. So, some amount of poly A tail is added in the nucleus and further extension of that happens in the cytoplasm ok. So, poly A tail is not present in the chromosome it is a separate enzyme that adds uh, you know A multiple A's continuously one after the other it does not require a template because you are just constantly adding A to an existing RNA. So, that is how that is made. So, so the summary is that after stop codon you do have RNA sequence and that is called 3 prime untranslated region and that contains a polyadenylation sequence that helps in cleavage of the primary transcript at the 3 prime end addition of a poly A tail. And let us go to the 5 prime now. 
So, in the phi prime similarly before the ATG you have sequence and that is called phi prime untranslated region and that is um, you know th that usually starts with the uh, base called transcription start site and that is modified like the 3 prime modified with poly ethyl this gets a cap phi prime cap okay it's a trimethyl uh, g added to it so that is the rna sequence but here uh, our in the dna sequence upstream of the atg you are going to have some rna sequence okay that is also part of the exon that is also in the genome while the trimethyl g is not part of the genome so then upstream of that you have promoter okay so promoter is where rna polymerase is going to bind and start transcribing and the first base that is transcribed is the transcription start site or the initiation site that is not atg atg is going to come further downstream at the end of phi prime untranslated region and the promoter region can have multiple parts in it which we will discuss in detail as we go Tata box is one that is present in all promoters. So, these are like core promoters, uh, promoter sequence which is required for transcription of any gene and there are special sequences that help in uh, differential gene expression. So, that we will talk about it when we go further. 